Hey, what's up, everyone? We are going to go ahead and get started now. Uh, so now you can see me. You can see my mouth moving. And if you can't hear any words coming out, just let me know, and we'll switch it over to a different microphone if we need to. Uh, welcome back. If y'all have been to this before, this is our third episode of Stranger Cases, where we're doing some unusual case presentations. My name is Eric. Uh, I work for MedGeeks, and I host the podcast. So hopefully we got some listeners of the podcast on tonight. Glad y'all are joining. Uh, as we go, I just want to let y'all know, I'm going to be keeping an eye on the comments that y'all can type in as we go. So if at any point you have any questions or you want me to repeat something or clarify something, or if I say something wrong, call me out. And uh, that way we can all get the best experience. Got a lot of people from all over the place. Glad y'all are here. All right, it's eight o'clock in Texas at least. So we're gonna go ahead and get started. Let me introduce this uh, case a little bit. This was a case that uh, it was a patient of mine that I saw in the emergency department about a month ago. And I thought it was a very interesting case. I thought it was gonna be one thing at the start, wound up being something completely different. And that's why I thought it would make a great case for tonight. So let's go ahead and get started here. So this is a case about a young woman with shoulder pain. And here's the case, 21 year old woman coming to the ED with right shoulder pain that started yesterday. She denies recent trauma. Pain is not exacerbated by any range of motion. And she first notices pain when she was laying down. Other things that she admits to is dysuria, suprapubic pain and low back pain for four days. She assumes that it's due to her premenstrual cramps. Her last menstrual period was four weeks ago, and she said that she was regular on her cycle, so she was thinking she might be about to start her period. I was also at this point thinking maybe a UTI. First thing I just wanna point out from this initial uh, slide here, shoulder pain without any recent trauma and not exacerbated by any sort of movement was kind of the first thing that I found strange in a 21 year old female. The reason for that is, I mean, she's obviously not really old enough to start developing osteoarthritis or anything like that. So it was kind of confusing to me at the start, but who knows, maybe there was something that she tweaked it and didn't really remember doing it. Additional history, college student, does work out regularly, said she mostly did cardio though. So not so much like heavy weight lifting or anything no repetitive overhead activities. She did take some ibuprofen, said it didn't really do anything. Felt like it was getting worse, so that's why she came to the ED. Past medical history of anemia and no surgeries in the past. Gilbert thought GI issues depending on pain scale. Absolutely, good call. That is a great idea. Uh, let's see, additional history. Oh wait, no, no, no. Do y'all want any additional history? I was gonna say, if y'all have any questions, throw them out there and I can give you more. Nancy's thinking referred pain. That's very wise of you, Nancy, yes. Gotta consider referred pain. A Lot of things can refer to the shoulder. So just to review, here's her ROS, mostly negative. This was a, um, a young, healthy female, thin, everything looked okay. You know, when you first walk in the room, non-distressed. Uh, her review of systems was pretty much negative except for the things I mentioned before suprapubic pain, dysuria, right shoulder pain, low back pain. Initially, I was kind of thinking this was two different complaints. You know, the shoulder pain and then like a kind of, oh, by the way, I may have a UTI was kind of what I was thinking at first. Um, so yeah, that's, that's what I thought at first, but obviously that wasn't the case or else that wouldn't be very interesting. Uh, good questions. The patient was sexually active and she was not on birth control. Ectopic pregnancy says Jess, and that is a good, good thing to be considering. That was very, very quickly on my differential as well. Anytime there's super pubic pain, that's kind of my first question is, are you pregnant? Uh, Oswaldo, reactive arthritis is another good thought as well. Absolutely. Liver and gallbladder also commonly refer to the, the shoulder area. So those are all good thoughts too. Let's continue. Here are vital signs. Vital signs were for the most part good. Her heart rate was a little higher than I like, uh, 97. I guess technically not tachycardic, but you know, pretty close. In the ER though, it seems like a lot of patients will start off pseudo tachycardic or, or 
tachycardic and then it eventually resolves a little bit. They're just a little anxious when they get there. I'm sure it's the same in clinical settings as well. Here's her physical exam, which I'll read through that. For the most part, normal. I think I made a slide where I kind of, yeah, here's a, a easier way to read it, highlighting the, uh, the pertinent positive. So her abdominal exam, she did have some tenderness in her lower abdomen bilaterally. And then when I examined her shoulder, pretty much an unremarkable shoulder exam. So she really did have full range of motion. She could, she could raise her arm like all the way up over her head and she didn't look like she was uncomfortable with that whatsoever. No tenderness as I was palpating around, no deformity, no edema, full strength. Uh, I didn't put it on here, but she had you know good pulses and everything. No, no, I did put it on there. Yeah, so everything was good. So this is starting to make me a little bit like more curious about what was going on. Some of the times when I'll, I'll see patients with a shoulder issue, but no trauma, I'm thinking, okay, maybe like tendonitis or bursitis, kind of an overuse situation, but she didn't have any tenderness there. So yeah, we got people saying gallbladder and cholecystitis. Yes, absolutely. Let's, uh, yeah, let's take a second and have people throw out some, I know y'all have been putting out differentials. Any others that someone wants to get in there? beforehand. Nancy PID, pelvic inflammatory disease. Excellent. <clears throat> Especially in a, uh, a young sexually active woman, for sure. Or yeah, PID or ectopic pregnancy, for sure. Things to consider. Here's the differential that I was working on at the time that I saw her. Nicole says ACS. Yeah, you'll see I put that on the, on the very last one uh, for my differential here, but let's go through these. Tendinitis or bursitis, like I said, you know, no trauma, you can still get shoulder pain. Maybe she had an occult muscle strain from when she was running, she was a student, maybe she's, you know, sitting uncomfortably for long periods of time at a, at a chair or something in a lecture. Um, let's see. Uh, rotator cuff tear. Again, the history didn't really fit too well, but I always consider that cervical radiculopathy. I don't think I mentioned, but her, her neck really had great range of motion. Uh, no tenderness, no history of neck issues before, although it's still a, a, something to consider. Biliary disease, like gallbladder, um, or maybe cholelithiasis, etc. can refer to the shoulder. UTI, that's mainly because she was having that lower pelvic area pain. Appendicitis, you wanna think about that too. Small bowel obstruction, perforation, PID or tubo ovarian abscess. Uh, and then, you know, all the ovarian stuff, torsion, cyst. And then of course, maybe she's just having, you know, cramps leading up to her period. Although she was saying this was a lot more discomfort than she's used to, but you know, and plus the shoulder things going on. And then kidney stones can have pelvic pain and then ACS, acute coronary syndrome. Now she's 21, really no past medical history other than the anemia. So it's a little unusual if a patient's gonna have ACS, but I mean, I'm not gonna say it's impossible. Definitely wanna keep it in mind if this were like a 64 year old woman who had hypertension and diabetes and you know, she's you know got a stent in the past. Yeah, okay, obviously that's really high on the differential. It's low on this patient's differential in my mind, but I definitely had it on there. Uh, Maria saying kidney stones. Yeah, absolutely. If you have kidney stones, sometimes they will refer down to the pelvic region, kind of that referred pain. If it's in the distal ureter, it can go that way. Okay, so workup. What tests do we need? Here's what I was considering. So all these labs are what I ordered. The CBC, CMP, lipase, UA, and HCG to get the pregnancy test. I checked all those things. Um, and then as far as imaging goes, I didn't order a shoulder x-ray. Uh, I put it on here as like an option to consider because she was having pain, but the exam was completely benign. I didn't, uh, I didn't feel like it was something that would be revealed with an x-ray. I was leaning more towards a soft tissue injury or referred pain, that sort of thing. So I, I held off on the x-ray. CT of the abdomen and pelvis or pelvic ultrasound, both of those are good considerations for anyone who's got pelvic or lower abdominal pain. 
it kind of just depends what you think. And of course you can order both. I mean, if you work in an emergency department, you've got access to both. Um, so oh, I will say ultimately I did wind up ordering both, but my first imaging choice was for the pelvic ultrasound. Uh, that's what I did. And it was basically based on the, the location of her pain. Let's say she only had right lower ab abdominal pain. And I'm thinking, okay, maybe this is the appendicitis or something. I might've gone for a CT, but hers was pretty low. It was like lower than McBurney's point, closer down towards like the uterus and the tubes and the ovaries and so forth. So I was thinking, let's do an ultrasound because I thought it would reveal a little bit more. And then other considerations, EKG and a troponin. That's if you're thinking ACS. So definitely I did order an EKG. Actually, I think I can't remember if it was me or if they did it in the triage area. I guess something she had said made someone want to get an EKG. I think it might've been her heart rate being a little high and then a traumatic shoulder pain, even though she was really young, but uh, we did get an EKG. Any other workup that anyone else would recommend other than these that we have here? And if so, what's the reasoning? What are you looking for? Uh, feel free to type them in and I'll keep an eye on the screen over there. Okay. Oh, and then uh, what I initially did was hydrocodone and some normal saline. There was a chance in my mind that the reason her heart rate was high was just because she was in a lot of pain, maybe a little dehydrated. So I treated her pain and I treated her uh, potential dehydration with some fluids. Uh, Jennifer, history of PCOS, no. No, I didn't, I didn't see any features that would make me think PCOS and she did not have that in the history or a history of PCOS. Here's her uh, EKG. This is a normal EKG, just kind of a normal sinus rate of 66, no evidence of STEMI whatsoever. Everything looked great on her EKG. Her heart rate had actually come down just a little bit according to this EKG, but to be honest with you, this isn't her actual EKG. So I just put a rate of 66 so that you wouldn't think I didn't know how to interpret this particular EKG I'm using. Her heart rate was higher than 66 though. Uh, Gilbert, I thought so too. Pain and anxiety could cause her heart rate to go up, so wouldn't be too concerned. Yeah, absolutely. And come to think, she did say she was a little anxious, but I mean, you know, everyone's kind of anxious when they come to the ER. I'm anxious when I go to the ER and I work there every day. Okay, CBC. Here's what we saw on the CBC as labs came back. <clears throat> as she mentioned, she does have a history of anemia, and that's really the only thing abnormal on her CBC. No leukocytosis. Uh, everything else looked good. Here's some other labs. Her comprehensive metabolic panel came back and this was essentially clear. Everything looked good. So this is a big hit to the biliary liver problems potentially that we were thinking. Um, because if she's got normal LFTs, you know, it's, it's very unlikely that she's going to have a significant enough problem that she's having pain radiating to her shoulder, although it's not impossible, but it definitely dropped it down on the differential sum for me. And then here's her UA, her lipase, troponin, and pregnancy test. The pregnancy test is one I was waiting for uh, with, you know, a lot of anticipation, and hers came back negative. She's not pregnant. So that takes a lot of things off the table. Well, not a lot of things, but one big thing of ectopic pregnancy off the table, which is nice. Uh, she did look like she had a little UTI. Luke esterase was positive and she did have some bacteria in her urine. Um, I did not think, you know, that was necessarily the cause of all of her pain though. I still wanted imaging at that point. So about an hour after, uh, she came to the ED and I first saw her. A nurse notified me that she was complaining that her pain was getting worse. So I decided to go reevaluate the patient. She states that her lower abdomen and pelvis feels a little bit more painful when she's sitting up. And when she lays down supine, her shoulder pain gets worse, which was unusual to me. I was like, okay, that's weird. I just figured maybe she was laying down and laying on the shoulder and that was causing it to hurt a little bit more. So let me go next here. 
here's a repeat set of vital signs or a new set of vital signs. Matt's asking about a pelvic exam. Her pelvic exam was normal. I did do a pelvic exam. Always a good idea to do a pelvic exam on any pelvic pain patient or lower abdominal pain patient in a female. Uh, she had no bleeding, no cervical motion, tenderness, no mass. Everything looked good on the pelvic exam. So her vitals, what do y'all notice about these vital signs? The new set of vitals. I just highlighted it to make it easy, but yeah, her, uh, her heart rate jumped up a little bit. Blood pressure went up slightly, but it's basically the same. So heart rate's going up despite an hour after me giving her some Norco and she's receiving IV fluids and she's laying down in bed. So we're kind of removing a lot of things that could raise the heart rate. You know, like we're treating the pain, we're treating the, uh, the dehydration potentially if that were a cause. And she's not, she didn't just walk in the door at this point. So that was concerning to me. Uh, let's see, Phil, any CVA tenderness? No, no CVA tenderness. And right upper quadrant ultrasound or D dimer. I did not get a right upper quadrant ultrasound. Um, and that's mainly because she didn't have any tenderness in that location. And her labs were normal too. If her labs had came back with you know, elevated ALKFOS or elevated bilirubin, AST, ALT, all that, I probably would have done it, even though she didn't have tenderness. Uh, but no tenderness in normal labs. I didn't feel like imaging was necessary of the gallbladder. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, D-dimer. Ooh, that's, that's interesting. So a D-dimer, obviously, we'd be testing that to look and see, um, you know, if we think there might be a pulmonary embolism, and that's a decent thought. I mean, they're having pain. Um, it's kind of lower abdominal pains. That's unusual, but they also have that shoulder pain. So maybe they're getting referred shoulder from the pleura, you know, getting uh, irritation of the pleura due to a PE. So that's a good thought, especially with tachycardia developing that's not responding to fluids. So uh, that definitely is a good thought. I did not order a D-dimer and You'll find out why when we get some other results back here in a second, because uh, I came to find out what the diagnosis was here in a minute from another test. Uh, let's see, endometriosis. No history of endometriosis, although yes, that's a possibility. Really difficult to make the diagnosis of endometriosis. I know, you know, technically I think you need to have direct visualization of the, the area that's affected with endometriosis. Of course, that pain will get worse during the time of uh, the menstrual cycle. So that's definitely a consideration for sure. In the ER, it's almost a, a diagnosis of exclusion though. Uh, diaphragm irritation causing increased pain, fluid in the abdomen, perf, all excellent points from Marlene. Very, very smart. Um, and yeah, that's actually the direction we're heading right now. Time to get CT with contrast, potentially, absolutely. Someone says PE, someone says dissection. Dissection is a good thought. Uh, ischemia of the gallbladder, aortic dissection. Yeah, everyone's kind of thinking the same things a little bit now. Ulcer, blood and peritoneum. Okay, I'm just gonna move on because y'all are all circling it. Y'all are all around it right now. So the pelvic ultrasound was ordered and this is what we saw. Large volume of intraperitoneal fluid extending from the pelvis all the way into the abdomen. I actually got a phone call from the, the ultrasound technician who was like, hey, there's like a ton of blood all in this woman's like pelvis and abdomen. And I was like, oh, okay. Thank you for telling me that. This was the what the radiologist read it as. They, they thought it was consistent with blood as well based on the echogenicity of it. And there was no readily identifiable uh, source of the bleed. So couldn't really tell from the ultrasound what was going on. I did decide, let's go ahead and do a CT scan because what if this is like a, a perforated appendix, other type of you know uh, bleed from somewhere else in the abdomen maybe? What if there's air in the abdomen too, pneumoperitoneum, um, in addition to the hemoperitoneum? So I got a CT. And the CT basically confirmed the same thing. Got a call from the radiologist on this one. He said there's a large amount of blood in the abdomen, hemoperitoneum extending from the pelvis to the upper abdomen, 
normal appearing bowels, uh, no evidence of perforation, no air. Um, and the appendix was visualized on the CT and appears grossly normal. So no signs of appendicitis or rupture of the appendix, no other acute findings. So we got an ultrasound that shows a bunch of blood. We got a CT scan that shows a bunch of blood and we don't really know where it is. She did have that lower pelvic pain. So that was kind of my only clue as to, you know, what may be causing it. And I was really, really, after I got this negative CT, I did exactly what Oswaldo just suggested. And that is I consulted OB, OBGYN, because I was thinking she might have a, uh, a cyst that had ruptured. And that's what the radiologist had hinted as well. He said, I don't see any evidence of a cyst, but certainly that could explain this amount of bleeding, given that there was no other clear identifiable source um, so yeah, here's what, what happened next. Given the pelvic discomfort, no other pathology, I called OB. They suspected a ruptured ovarian cyst as well. They agreed, let's get her admitted. And what they decided to do was monitor the vital signs and get some serial hemoglobin hematocrits to see if the bleeding was going to stop. Um, the time I was seeing her, she was a little bit tachycardic. And I made that aware, made the gynecologist aware. And they were like, okay, I don't think we need to necessarily take her to the OR right now. And I did tell her that's fine. I mean, she looks clinically stable on my end as well, but definitely need to keep close eye on her. Um, three hours after she was admitted, the patient has persistent tachycardia and the hemoglobin dropped from 10.9 initially down to 8.2. So that is a, that's a significant drop. That's almost three points dropped in several hours. This was maybe four or five hours after the initial lab had been drawn. Um, so, you know, that's, that's not a small drop and it's certainly not a result of just IV fluid dilution or something like that. And given that she was still tachycardic, there was concern that she was having continued bleeding. So the patient was taken to the OR by gynecology at that time. Uh, they underwent laparoscopic surgery and they found that there was an active bleed from a ruptured ovarian cyst. So, and it was left sided. Her pain really wasn't, she didn't say it was like my left side is what's hurting. Um, but that's where the bleed came from. So that's basically the, uh, the diagnosis right there. What happened next was during surgery, they were able to stop the bleeding. They uh, achieved good hemostasis in the OR. No oophorectomy was needed. She got to keep the ovary, which is always good. <clears throat> she was observed for two days post-op, and she was great. She's stable H and H from that point forward. Vital signs normalized. She did not need to get a transfusion. Um, oh, Jennifer makes a good point that I didn't put in the slides though to get a type and screen. Um, Yes, once I, once I heard from the ultrasound tech that there was a bunch of blood in the pelvis and abdomen, I put in a type and screen as well. And that's, a, that's something I should have mentioned in the slides as well. Type and screen for sure in case you need like a rapid transfusion or something. Um, so yeah, the patient was observed for two days. They wound up going home safe and sound. So diagnosis ruptured ovarian cyst with hemoperitoneum. Pretty interesting case, I thought so. Um, let's go over some teaching points from this case. As I'm doing so, please feel free to throw some comments or questions out, different thoughts, etc. So, ovarian cyst rupture. Generally, the way this is going to present is a unilateral pelvic pain that's relatively sudden in onset. Sharp pain is usually how they describe it, and it's usually on one side more than the other. Important to rule out ectopic pregnancy, obviously, any type of pelvic pain. Pain is caused by the peritoneal irritation from the blood. So that blood irritates the peritoneum and that's what causes the pain. You can also get pain from just the expansion and stretching of the capsule around the ovary if the cyst is hemorrhaging. Pain is often the most severe right at the beginning and then it kind of gradually improves. Most of the time, um, over 24 to 72 hours, it kind of self-resolves, the pain does. 
Occasional nausea and vomiting is sometimes seen with the, with the ovarian cyst rupture. Uh, most cases are pretty uncomplicated and you can just kind of manage it expectantly, meaning it's going to get better on its own. If there are any signs of complications like hemodynamic instability, this patient was showing, I guess, the first signs of that with the tachycardia, although blood pressure had been stable the whole time she was in the department. And even when they went to the OR, her blood pressure had remained stable, which is good. But definitely if you see blood pressure dropping, tachycardia, you want to bring them to the OR much, much more quickly or get OBGYN involved immediately. Um, another complication would be if it's a very large volume hemoperitoneum. <clears throat> Fever, leukocytosis could indicate that there's an infectious cause going on and then ongoing bleeding, meaning the bleeding's still going, hemoglobin's dropping, et cetera. Uh, we got some questions from Jordan. Shoulder pain worse lying down. Is that due to the referred pain or from the peritoneal irritation or both? So I'm going to answer that on the next slide, actually. But that's a good question. Uh, then why bilateral abdominal pain to deep palpation? I think that was the, re the reason for that is the blood had been on both sides. Uh, it wasn't just tenderness right where you push on the affected ovary. It was kind of the whole region where that blood was sort of pooling down in the lower pelvis, irritating the peritoneum. And then uh, here's how you manage a hemodynamically stable patient with a large hemoperitoneum. Generally, you just keep them inpatient for observation and monitor them with the serial hemoglobins, vital signs, et cetera. And that was kind of the plan with her, but of course she kind of decompensated a little bit with the uh, hemoglobin continuing to drop. If the patient develops hypotension, tachycardia, altered mental status, syncope, h and is dropping, all of these things are indications for surgical intervention. Um, of course, that's the decision that should be made by OB-GYN, whether or not to go to the ER or to the OR. But if you see any of those things, if and this is your patient, it's time to really get them involved quickly. Uh, and, and explain those things to them. And as far as the surgical approach, laparoscopy is generally the best one, lowest morbidity and mortality rates. Uh, so let's talk about ovarian cyst ruptures, differential diagnosis. I just wanted to make a quick list here. These are kind of the, the can't miss things when it comes to pelvic pain in a female. Um, I think at one point or another, someone in the comments mentioned every single one of these. So that's good, excellent. But yeah, ectopic pregnancy, for sure. Got to get that pregnancy test like ASAP on any any female patient with abdominal pain or lower pelvic pain or a variety of other complaints too. It's always a good idea. Acute appendicitis, for sure. PID, tubo ovarian abscess, and ovarian torsion. So for this patient, PID and tubo ovarian abscess, I was leaning away from, uh, mainly because the pelvic exam was pretty benign no discharge, no, no cervical motion tenderness, etc. Also, there was no white count, which you would expect to go up in both those conditions. Same thing with appendicitis. Excuse me. Uh, ovarian torsion is definitely something you would pick up on an ultrasound. You, you try and make sure that there's good blood flow to the bilateral ovaries. Okay, so let's talk about why she had shoulder pain. So Hans Kerr, is the guy, I don't know why I put his picture on here. I just thought he was a cool looking guy. Kerr's sign is referred pain to the supraclavicular area or the shoulder area due to irritation of the diaphragm. So in her case, there was blood in the belly. And when she laid supine, the blood was, you know, traveling superior and irritating the, uh, the diaphragm. That causes referred pain to the shoulder. So classically, I think the, the original Kerr's sign was referred pain to the left shoulder in the case of a splenic rupture. So the reason this happens is our phrenic nerve, which is obviously what supplies our diaphragm, shares the same nerve roots as the supraclavicular nerves. So C3, 4, and 5 is where the phrenic nerve comes from. 3, 4, and 5 keep you alive. And then supraclavicular nerves are C3 and 4. So the supraclavicular nerves are responsible for that sensation, the cutaneous sensation of the skin above the uh, the collarbone area bilaterally. So that's how you get that referred pain when the uh, when the diaphragm is irritated by blood or some other fluid like pus or an abscess nearby. Even if you had like a raging cholecystitis or cholangitis, that could cause it too. Um, 
Acute pain is often exacerbated by laying supine. That's just because when you lay supine or even Trendelenburg a little bit, that, you know, fluid is going to travel the path of least resistance and come up and irritate the diaphragm. Here's some pictures um, kind of explaining that a little bit. I, I'm not super familiar from anatomy of the supraclavicular nerves. Um, so I thought I'd put a picture in here just kind of showing where they're located and how they uh, innervate the skin around the collarbone over the trapezius muscles and even out towards the superior part of the deltoid. So that's how that happens. Then, uh, and then that's the, the nerve roots for the phrenic nerve on the picture on the right side as well. <clears throat> this is a cool diagram of, excuse me, they got to see. Nope, don't. This is a cool diagram showing uh, all the locations of common locations of referred pain. And you can see any lung or diaphragm irritation could definitely cause uh, radiation to the top there, but there's all the others as well. All right, so we're wrapping up here. If you've got questions, get them ready and send them because I'm basically just summarizing at this point. Uh, key takeaways, always consider referred pain in the absence of trauma. And one of the, one of the people listening tonight made an excellent comment very early on. She said, I was, I'm thinking referred pain and that's good because that turned out to be absolutely correct. Um, and this is especially the case if there's no sort of reproducible pain. If you can't reproduce that pain, is it really musculoskeletal? I mean, you should be able to reproduce truly musculoskeletal pain by pushing on it, twisting it, taking them through their range of motion, et cetera. You should be able to do that. And I wasn't with her case. Other things that can cause referred pain to the shoulder would be acute coronary syndrome, like a heart attack, uh, gallbladder or liver disease, pneumonia, the diaphragm irritation, that's Kerr's sign like we talked about, cervical radiculopathy, or even carpal tunnel syndrome. I don't know that that's in textbooks, but I see a lot of people who are dead ringer for carpal tunnel syndrome and it kind of radiates up the arm, or at least they say it does. Um, so, you know, maybe it's another peripheral nerve entrapment as opposed to technically being carpal tunnel, but maybe I should have wrote that instead, just any sort of peripheral nerve irritation. Um, the one I didn't put on here that came up in the, in the talk today was pulmonary embolism. Anything that irritates, like, so the reason you would get referred pain from pneumonia or from the lungs in general is because you have irritation of the pleura, that, you know, membrane that surrounds the lungs anything that would irritate that pleura could cause pain radiating to the shoulder, uh, either shoulder. So whether it's pneumonia or whether it's a pulmonary embolism or it's a bad pleural effusion, or you've got some type of abscess or, or anything going on in the thorax that's irritating the pleural wall, it can refer pain to the shoulder. So lung stuff for sure. All right, a few other takeaways. Uh, this one was key. So there was kind of a turning point in this case, you'll notice, and that was when the patient said she wasn't getting better and her, her uh, vital signs were worsening despite me giving her medicine that should have been making it better. Um, and that was when her tachycardia went up or became worse. So definitely don't want to discharge abnormal vital signs. Um, I emphasize the word unexplained abnormal vital signs. Um, or unexplained tachycardia, because sometimes you can explain it. You know, if, if a patient comes in for asthma exacerbation and you're giving them albuterol, that's going to cause their heart rate to go up. So you don't need to be alarmed in that case so much because you can explain it. Um, so if you are going to discharge, let's say, someone who came in with an asthma exacerbation and they're tachy, you should probably put that in your chart. Patient is tachycardic. I believe this is because they were given albuterol recently. Um, I do not suspect something else such as sepsis or pulmonary embolism or whatever it may be. So um, other things can cause tachycardia. And if you know what it is, then you're less worried. Say so it's a chronic pain patient or something and you are unable to fully get their pain down to a normal level and it's just still there a little bit. Or you got a patient who's, you know, taken drugs recently or, or anything like that that can explain it, but you still feel they're stable to be discharged. Always, always, you know, be careful about that, but definitely uh, document what your thinking is there. Uh, reassessment of the patient's pain and response to therapy is a powerful tool for determining who can be safely discharged. I remember learning this when I started in the emergency department fairly early. Uh, 
the the time course, the story that you're telling from when the patient got here to when the patient was dispositioned, whether they're going home or staying in the hospital, that story you're telling is very important. Um, and you need multiple time points throughout it, ideally, unless it's something really minor. If it's something where it's like, okay, they could be sick and you're working them up a little bit, multiple checks, creating a timeline. They came in like this. I thought it was this. So I gave them medicine to treat this and then they started to get better. Therefore, I still think it was this and not this, you know, there's a lot of pronouns in there. So I apologize, but you know, that's kind of what you want to do is paint the picture from start to finish. Did the patient get better? Did the patient not get better? Did the patient actually get worse? And generally, if you want to send a patient home, you need to be proving to the person reading your note, the lawyer reading your note later on that you proved that you could make them better. And it, you know, reinforced your differential diagnosis for what you thought was going on. So definitely use the, the reassessment function uh, or, you know, tool to justify your decision making. Um, another point, most ovarian cyst ruptures are managed expectantly uh, in the outpatient setting. You want to watch for hemodynamic compromise, signs of large volume, hemoperitoneum, et cetera. But for the most time, most part, I don't want the takeaway from this to be, oh, ovarian cysts, go to the ER or, you know, it's a big deal. Sometimes it can be like in this case, but the vast majority of the time there's no surgery required. It's a very common thing. Um, let's see. Next one. Differential for the female pelvic pain. Again, ectopic, PID, TOA, ovarian torsion, appendicitis, UTI, kidneys known. Um, let's see. Oswaldo's got a question. What about the UTI? Would that be considered as a separate diagnosis in addition to the ruptured ovarian cyst? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, that's a good point. I kind of just left that behind, didn't I, because it was less exciting to me. But yeah, um, patient did have a UTI as well. So I would send a urine culture on that, treat them with antibiotics for sure. Um, yeah, separate, separate diagnosis for sure. Okay, any other questions? Please feel free to uh, to throw them my way. I'm gonna get a drink of water. Hang on. All right. Yeah. Send me some questions. So. Um, I hope y'all listen to the podcast. You know, the podcast is awesome. And I, I am completely biased because I host the podcast. However, I really uh, hope y'all listen to it. I try to keep it interesting, try to keep it fun um, and useful. Try not to keep it too long, lengthy, because I know that y'all are busy and probably driving and may not have that long of a commute. So it's like, hey, let me get this over with so I can listen to some music uh, as well. But, you know, the podcast is awesome. I try to keep it around 15 minutes or less. Um, there is a website that you can go to askmedgeeks.com and askmedgeeks.com is like a short survey when you pull it up and you basically put in like three things and you can ask a question. It goes directly to myself and Andrew. And the whole point is for us to be able to answer, uh, board style questions that you may have if you're struggling with certain topics, um, anything that you think is you know, an interesting topic that we can cover on the podcast, uh, on the podcast, send them in. Um, we love reading them and we love give, getting feedback from y'all as well about how to make the, the podcast better. Personally, I got, you know, introduced to MedGeeks when I was a student and it was the podcast that kind of hooked me, kind of got me in because it was, it was useful and it was helpful and I liked it. So I want that to be the case for everyone who listens. So help me out, send me suggestions. Tell me my voice sounds weird. Tell me I need to talk slower or talk faster, whatever you want. Uh, I'd love to do that. And then, of course, our website, www.medgeeks.co, and you can uh, check us out on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube. Awesome. So I think I got another question here maybe down a second ago. Jordan says, have you seen TOA or PID without fever? We're always taught to look for it um with fever when anyone complaining of suprapubic pain you know 
I probably have, to be honest, seen that. I'm trying to think. I can't remember specifically, but I I would say yes. It, it would not, I would not be surprised if a TOA, a tubo ovarian abscess, or a pelvic inflammatory disease did present a febrile. Um, it would really surprise me if there was no other symptoms. I mean, there's I would say things that are more likely to show up are going to be pelvic pain, pelvic pressure, uh, vaginal discharge. There's going to be a history of um, multiple sex partners, things like that, that are high risk. There's going to be a history of STDs likely in the past as well. There's usually some risk factors to pick up on there. But no, I don't think every patient has to have a fever in order to have suspicion for an abscess or PID. Uh, and that goes for tachycardia as well. Classically, yes. You know, if, if it's a, if it's on a board question of some kind, probably, you know, they're probably going to be febrile. They're going to have to paint the picture that it's an infectious process somehow. But uh, I would say it's not a guarantee. Although if they do have fever and pelvic pain, that definitely makes me very concerned about an abscess or PID. Let's see if there are any other questions. Santa says, great case, had an ectopic pregnancy this year. I can relate. Ectopic pregnancies are kind of scary. When you see them, you're like, oh my gosh, it actually is one. Look at that. Call OB now. Yeah, for sure. Good catch, catching that. Um, cool. Uh, does ruptured ovarian cyst have a high recurrence rate? In my experience, I don't work in OB. I'm not an OB. PA or, or a gynecology PA, um, but I would say of of the patients that I see who I, I wind up diagnosing with ovarian cysts, um, I would say that, yeah, they, they do tend to be recurrent. So for whatever reason, um, women who make ovarian cysts that are symptomatic tend to make more than one. And a lot of times they'll, they'll come in and they'll say, I'm pretty sure I have an ovarian cyst again. So they'll say, uh, They'll say, uh, you know, I'm pretty sure that's what it is. I've had one before, et cetera. All right. Do, do, do. Any other questions? Any other concerns? I, uh, I appreciate y'all listening in and hope y'all got a lot out of this. We are going to do another one next month as well. Um, I'm pretty sure I know what case I'm going to do but I'm still working on it to make sure. Um, but yeah, let me, let me uh, hear y'all's feedback on askmedgeeks.com related to the podcast and love to hear from y'all again at some point. Uh, oh, we got a question. Someone asked about the UA results. Was this due to the ruptured cyst? The UA, no, it was not. The UA coming back as uh, a UTI was not related to the cyst. It was separate. So two different things going on there. I don't believe that there's any connection between a ruptured ovarian cyst and bacteriuria and leukocyte esterase. I'm not aware of that if it is. Um, so in, in my opinion, that, that was a separate thing. And it wasn't an overwhelmingly uh, convincing UA for a UTI either. I think it was just like leuk esterase and some bacteria um, I would probably treat it, you know, especially since she's going to be going into the hospital uh, anyway. But if she's asymptomatic and not having dysuria, unlike the patient we saw in this case, if she's not having symptoms and that was her UA, I would I would probably consider holding off and sending a urine culture and just calling her back if it came back positive and treating or if she became symptomatic in the meantime, treating at that point. But yeah, separate diagnosis. Okay. Very good. I think that's a wrap. Thank you all again for joining and I look forward to doing this again next month. Y'all take care. Thanks.